Welcome back to the deep dive. We're continuing our journey through the MPEP. That's uh, the Manual of Patent Examining Procedure. Mm -hmm. And today we are hitting a really, really crucial section, Chapter 2100, which is all about patentability. Yeah, this is foundational stuff. If you want a U.S. patent, your invention has to pass muster under the rules laid out here. Exactly. Think of it like the main checklist. Does the invention even qualify for patent protection? Right. And our goal today is, you know, to sort of unpack the main points from Chapter 2100, give you a solid handle on what examiners are looking for without you having to read the whole dense chapter yourself right now. We're aiming to be your shortcut through the core requirements. We'll be talking about uh, four key statutes, sections 101, 102, 103, and 112 of the U.S. Patent Law. And that means we'll cover what kinds of things can be patented that's subject matter eligibility under 101. Plus, utility is it useful? Novelty is it actually new? Nor obviousness, which is, you know, is it more than just a trivial step forward? And finally, oh. section 112, how well do you have to actually describe your invention? And chapter 2100 gets into some, let's say, trickier areas too, doesn't it? Especially these things called judicial exceptions. Oh, absolutely. Abstract ideas, laws of nature, natural phenomena. You can't just patent those things outright. So the MPEP explains how the patent office, the USPTO, figures out if a claim is trying to do that. Exactly. It lays out the procedures, including uh, the big one. The two-part Alice Mayo test will definitely break that down. Okay, good. That test sounds important for figuring out if a claim directed to, say, an abstract idea actually adds something genuinely inventive, something significantly more. Precisely. And we'll touch on some key court cases, too, ones that really shaped how we understand these rules. Cases like um, Diamond v. Deer. Right, about computer processes. Chakrabarty on living organisms. Ah, yes. Mayo v. Prometheus for diagnostic methods. And Alice Court v. CLS Bank, which is huge for software and business methods. Yeah, those cases really help illustrate how these concepts play out in practice. Okay, let's dive in then. Chapter 2100, as you said, it's the examiner's guide for checking compliance with Title 35 of the U.S. Code. It really is. It walks them through... Assessing applications against those key sections we mentioned. 101 for eligibility, 102 for novelty, 103 for non-obviousness, and a 112 for the specification requirements. Let's start at the beginning then. Section 101, subject matter eligibility. This is like the first hurdle, right? What makes something eligible? Well, the statute itself lists four categories. Your invention has to be a process, a machine, a manufacturer, which is basically a made article or a composition of matter, like a chemical. Seems pretty broad. It is broad. But as we mentioned, the courts have carved out exceptions. Things you can't patent. The judicial exceptions. <laughs> abstract ideas, laws of nature, natural phenomena. You can't patent EMCR, for example. Exactly. You can't patent gravity. You can't patent a mathematical formula in the abstract. Yeah. So the MPEP gives examiners a framework for analyzing claims that might touch on these areas. And that's where the Alice Mayo test comes in. That's the main tool the USPTO uses now. It's a two-step process. Step one, is the claim directed to one of those judicial exceptions? So not just mentioning it, but is that what the claim is really about? Pretty much. They look at the core focus of the claim. And if the answer is yes, it is directed to an exception. Then you go to step two. Right. Step two asks, does the claim as a whole recite something significantly more than the exception itself? Is there an inventive concept in how that exception is applied? So just saying do this abstract idea on a generic computer probably isn't enough. Usually not. You need something extra, some specific inventive application or improvement beyond just, you know, automating a known concept or observing a natural law. The MPEP uses the Mayo case to explain this for laws of nature, right? Yes. Mayo v. Prometheus. That case involves claims about optimizing drug dosage based on observing a natural correlation in the body. The Supreme Court said, look, the correlation itself is a law of nature, and the steps for observing it were just routine medical practices. There wasn't enough extra there, no real inventive concept beyond the natural law itself. Makes sense. And Alice, that's the big one for abstract ideas, especially with computers. Absolutely. Alice Corp v. CLS Bank. The court looked at claims for managing risk in financial transactions using a computer. They said the basic idea was an abstract concept, intermediated settlement. Uh, and just implementing that abstract idea on a generic computer system wasn't enough to make it patent eligible. Again, they were looking for that significantly more, like an improvement in computer functionality itself, not just using the computer as a tool for the abstract idea. So examiners really have to analyze the substance of the claim. They do. And another thing the MPEP mentions here is the 
broadest reasonable interpretation standard, or BRI. Ah, BRI, how does that fit in? During examination, the examiner gives the claim terms their broadest reasonable meaning, consistent with the description in your application. This wide interpretation can sometimes make a claim look more like it's directed to an abstract idea or cover more ground than you intended. So claim drafting is key there. Okay, eligibility under 101, checked. What about utility? Sounds simple. It yes, has yeah. to be useful. It does sound simple, but the MPEP clarifies it needs specific and substantial utility. Specific and substantial, meaning? Meaning it can't be just some vague theoretical or throwaway use. You need to show a well-defined, real-world, practical benefit. You can't just patent a chemical compound saying it might be useful for something someday, maybe. Got it. Needs a real job to do. Okay, next up, novelty. Section 102, what makes an invention new? Novelty means your invention wasn't anticipated by the prior art. Prior art is basically the universe of public knowledge existing before your effective filing date. So patents, articles, stuff people were already doing. It's exactly. Patents, publications, public uses, sales, offers for sale, anything accessible to the public. If a single piece of prior art discloses every single element of your claimed invention, arranged as in your claim, then your invention isn't novel. It's anticipated. The MPEP mentions pre-AIA 102E. What's that about, quickly? Ah, yeah, that relates to older applications filed before the America Invents Act, the AIA. Yeah. Under the old law, certain published U.S. patent applications could count as prior art as of their filing date, not okay. just their publication date. It's a nuance for older cases. Okay. And there's also something about AIA 102B1B. Sounds like a way out of prior art sometimes. Yes, that's part of the current law. It provides a grace period, essentially. Mm -hmm. If you, the inventor, publicly disclosed your invention, say, at a conference, within one year before you filed your patent application, yeah. and then later someone cites that same disclosure or a later one derived from it against you as prior art, this section might allow you to disqualify it. It protects inventors from their own early disclosures, to an extent. That's helpful. Okay, novelty is about being new. What about section 103, non-obviousness? This sounds fuzzier. It definitely involves more judgment. An invention can be technically new. Maybe no single prior art reference shows everything, but still not patentable if it's considered obvious. Obvious to whom? To a person having ordinary skill in the art, mm -hmm. or facita. That's the standard. Examiners have to imagine someone with typical knowledge and skill in that specific field at the time the invention was made. And they ask if that person would have found the invention obvious. Yes. They look at the differences between your invention and the prior art. And they ask, would it have been obvious for that skilled person to bridge those differences, to combine known elements from different pieces of prior art, maybe, to arrive at your invention? Is there usually a reason needed to combine things? Well, the MPEP emphasizes considering the prior art as a whole. Were there teachings, suggestions, or motivations in the prior art that would have led someone skilled to make that combination? The MPEP brings up the KSR case here. KSR v. Teleflex, what did that change? KSR was a big Supreme Court case. It basically said the test for obviousness shouldn't be too rigid. Before KSR, courts often required a very explicit teaching, suggestion, or motivation, TSM, the prior art, to combine references. Okay. KSR said, hold on, common sense matters too. Obviousness can be based on market pressures, design needs, general knowledge in the field. It made the analysis more flexible, more holistic. If combining known elements yields predictable results, it's more likely obvious. Right. More common sense, less rigid formula. Okay, so we have eligibility, utility, novelty, non-obviousness. What's the last major piece from Chapter 2100? That would be Section 112, Adequacy of Disclosure. This is all about your patent application itself, the specification. Does it properly describe and support your invention? And 112 seems to have a few parts. Let's start with the 112A. Right. 112A covers two key things, written description and enablement. Okay, written description. Yeah. This means your specification has to describe the invention in enough detail to show that you, the inventor, were actually in possession of the claimed invention when you filed the application. Someone skilled in the art reading your description should understand what you invented and that you had it. Does it have to use the exact same words as the claims? The MPP mentions cases like Eiselstein and Wertheim? No, not necessarily the exact words in haec verba, as the lawyers say, but the description must adequately convey the claimed features. And it's not just about words. Cases like Ariad show that if you use broad functional language in claims describing what something does, you need sufficient description of the structure or acts that perform that function. And Enzo Biochem, what's the takeaway there? 
Enzo is a reminder that just copying your claim language into the specification doesn't automatically satisfy written description. You need actual descriptive support. Sometimes an original claim itself might lack sufficient written description support in the specification as filed. Okay, so describe it well enough to show you how to. What's the other part of the 112a? Enablement. Enablement. This means your specification must teach someone skilled in the art how to make and use the full scope of your claimed invention without needing undue experimentation. Undue experimentation, like too much guesswork or trial and error. Exactly. The description needs to be a blueprint, clear and complete enough for a skilled person to practice the invention mm. based on what's written, maybe combined with their existing knowledge, but without having to invent it all over again. Makes sense. Okay, that's 112A. What about 100B? 112B is about the claims themselves. It also has two main requirements, definiteness and claiming what the inventor regards as the invention. Of definiteness. So the claims need to be clear. Very clear. They must particularly point out and distinctly claim the invention. Think of it as drawing sharp, unambiguous boundaries around your protected territory. People need to be able to read the claim and understand what infringes and what doesn't. The MPP mentions functional claiming again here, with cases like Swinehart, Halliburton, United Carbon. Can that cause definiteness problems? It can. While functional language isn't automatically bad if it's too broad or vague and doesn't provide an objective standard for determining the scope, the claim might be indefinite, especially if the function is claimed at the point of novelty, meaning it's the key distinguishing feature. And what about those means plus function claims, section 112F? Right, that's a specific type of functional claiming. If you write a claim element as means for doing something, or step for in method claims, 112F or the old paragraph 6 for pre-AIA cases says that element covers only the specific structures, materials, or acts described in your specification for performing that function, plus their equivalents. So you have to describe the means in the spec. Cases like null and aristocrat are mentioned. Absolutely. If you use means plus function language, you must disclose corresponding structure in the specification. If you don't, the claim oh. might be indefinite for failing to meet 112B because its scope is unclear, and it might also fail 112A for lacking written description support for that structure. Okay. And the last bit of 112B, claiming what the inventor regards as the invention. Yeah, this basically means your claims should reflect what you actually set out as your invention in the specification. They shouldn't be wildly broader, narrower, or just different from what you described and identified as the invention. It's about consistency between the claims and the disclosure. Wow, okay, that's a lot packed into chapter 2100. So just to recap the big pillars, section 101, subject matter eligibility, navigating those judicial exceptions with the Alice Mayo test. Mm -hmm. Then you need utility specific and substantial. Section 102, novelty, it has to be new compared to the Prior art. Section 103, non-obviousness. It can't be just an obvious tweak on existing stuff, thinking about KSR. And section 112, the disclosure, adequate written description, enablement so others can make and use it, and definite claims that match what you invented. That's the core of it. Understanding these patentability requirements is absolutely fundamental for anyone interacting with the U.S. patent system. Inventors, attorneys, examiners, even business folks making decisions about IP. It really sets the stage for everything else. And uh, before we wrap up, we definitely want to give a huge thank you to Mike Shepard. Yes, absolutely. Mike's the creative director who organized and produced this whole MPP audio summary project. Mm -hmm. His work is what makes these deep dives possible. Could he do it without him? And now, the necessary disclaimer. Right. Please remember. This summary of the MPEP was generated using AI tools, including ChatGPT and Notebook LM, and may contain errors or omissions. It is provided for general educational and informational purposes only. It is not legal advice or a substitute for formal instruction. For authoritative guidance, you should always consult the official MPEP itself, a qualified instructor, or, of course, a registered patent practitioner. Okay. So to leave you with something to think about, we've talked a lot about the Alice Mayo test and finding that inventive concept beyond just an abstract idea or natural law. With technology, especially AI and biotech, advancing so rapidly, how do you think the interpretation of what counts as significantly more or an inventive concept will continue to evolve? Where will that line be drawn in the future? That's a great question. It's constantly being debated and refined by the courts in the USPTO, something definitely worth keeping an eye on. We encourage you to explore the official MPEP for the latest guidance.